Welcome to another episode of Digging Deeper. I'm thrilled to join you today with um, a dear brother in Christ and fellow pastor, Scott Sauls, as we continue in this series that we've been in, thinking about uh, the the opportunity that we had to dig deeper into um, God's design, God's design for sexuality, for singleness, for marriage. Uh, Scott is someone that I uh, respect deeply and love his pastor's heart and his uh, his wisdom. And so, um, Scott, thanks for joining us, man. Uh, you're up in Nashville, so we've got you on Zoom, and uh-huh. uh, grateful for modern technology. And yes. uh, thanks for joining us, brother. Thanks, Jeff. Great to be with you. Yeah, man. Let me uh, let me tell you a little bit about Scott. Scott is uh, he's the pastor since 2012 at Christ Pres Church in in Nashville. Uh, I'm using inside lingo. Pres means Presbyterian. So pre- <laughs> pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church in Nashville. Um, he previously uh, was a lead and preaching pastor for Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, where he was able to work alongside uh, Tim Keller, which. Um, is awesome. He's planted and pastored churches in Kansas City and St. Louis and uh, author of six books that I want to talk about in just a second. But first, I have to mention this. I noticed uh, that married to your wife, Patty, uh, and you guys have two daughters. Mm -hmm. Here's what I noticed, whose names are Abby and Ellie. Mm -hmm. Those are, I have three daughters. Two of my three are named Abby and Ellie. Nice. So uh, that jumped off the page at me. Which means well, we about that? we just are kindred spirits, and we're meant to be yes. deep friends, right? I don't know if you know <laughs> that, but um, but Welcome no, that's that. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so all right, you've written six books. I want to talk about the, your latest one before we jump into the content of uh, on sexuality. Uh, but this just came out, right? Like within the last month, correct? Yes. Uh, well, actually, uh, June, early June. Early June. Okay, so it's been a couple of months. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called "Beautiful People Don't Just Happen." How God Redeems Regret, Hurt, and Fear in the Making of Better Humans. Love that title. Um, Take a couple of minutes. Tell us about it. I I haven't read it yet. I told you before we started. It's like I'm a bad bad host here because I haven't read it yet, but I can't (laughs) wait to read it. Um, And we'll start it soon. But tell us about it. No worries. So um, I appreciate that. The book's title actually is pulled from a quote by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is a renowned grief expert and she has this quote uh that uh, where she she says that the most remarkable people that she's ever met are people who have known defeat and and you know hit bottom in some way shape or form uh and emerged from those depths and 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 you know these people have a a humility about them an approachability about mm-hmm. them a wisdom about them and then the last the last uh the last phrase is beautiful people do not just happen and so the title comes from that quote and i think that the the full excerpt which i just paraphrased is a pretty good summation of what what i'm after what what i wanted to do with this particular project was essentially to provide a pastoral counselor in your pocket uh that that um uh, that that you can get for close to nothing and and hopefully can be a resource uh, especially if you find yourself contending with one of what i call the the three primary pain points of being a human one mm-hmm. is regret which has to do with the guilt and the shame that we we contend with and that we wrestle with being the fallen humans that we are and how does the as the gospel brought to bear on that how can we resource the accesses uh, access the resources of the gospel, uh, you know, in the face of things like guilt and shame. And then hurt would be just the reality of living life in a fallen world where disappointment happens every day, where uh, dreams don't come true. Uh, sometimes, oftentimes where our best laid plans fall apart uh, as the pandemic has, you know, yeah. helped us help, helped happen for us. Uh, and then, and then fear or anxiety about the future worry, uh, those sorts of things. And so, so the book is really designed to be a, a written version of what maybe a pastor or a counselor could offer for any or all of those different, different, uh, pain points. And I interact a lot with the stuff that, um, obviously you and I are immersed in every day, Jeff, just the pastoral stuff, Mm -hmm. digging into scripture, 
accessing Christ and the gospel for all the different, you know, challenges that we face for being human. Uh, but also a lot of the stuff that I've learned from from counseling and from from mm. you know receiving from wise people in my life. And so, you know, for me, counseling has been expensive and, and, um, you know, uh, it's just a lot of the healing that's taken place in my life has involved a, a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of time. And, uh, you know, what, if, what if I could just take all of that and consolidate it into one tight little 200 page resource that can help people. And it's, it's, it's a transparent book. I tell a lot of my own story and share a lot of my own you know, battles and failures and, and how God met me and all those things. And hopefully it can be a, a resource for a, anyone who uh, is contending on any level with, with regret, hurt, fear, you know, any combination of those three things uh, or who finds themselves uh, showing up for mm. people who are contending with those things as a, as a friend, as a parent, as a, as a, an advocate, as a helper. And so, um, so yeah, um, I mean, pastors and counselors have have uh, you know you know so far there's been a really strong response positively from from those two particular groups in terms of it being a resource they want to pass on to mm -hmm. the the people that they serve uh, and seek to encourage and so that's the goal that's the hope and and that's kind of a general flyby of what it's about. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know, one of the things again I appreciate about you so much is is your your vulnerability, your honesty just even the the posture that you would have to to write a book and and be willing to share i'm just reading here as i was reading about the book um you know from from his own seasons of regret hurt and fear including battles with anxiety and depression he knows what it's like to be unfinished and on the mend under jesus's merciful mighty healing hand i don't know if you wrote that or someone wrote that about your book but that's powerful um and um and it certainly makes me want to read your book because mm -hmm. um, uh, my perimeter folks know that I've shared about struggles in my past with anxiety and depression. And, mm -hmm. um, and the more we can talk about it and the more that we can press the gospel into it and the more that we can yeah. uh, move towards one another as we, as we move towards mm -hmm. Jesus together um, yeah. is awesome. So yeah. it, and, and it serves as your book here even serves as a segue into what I'd love to talk to you about. Uh, when you when we talk about you know hurt, um, regret, pain, mm -hmm. um, the common experiences of being human, mm -hmm. and how uh, yeah, there's just a lot with being human in a fallen body yeah. in a fallen world, yeah. and we think about um, we think about God's design, mm -hmm. and. Um, we're recording this on the week after that I, I preached the previous Sunday on God's design for sexuality. Mm -hmm. And um, man, obviously what a heavy, complex topic. Um, the scriptures lay out for us very clearly what God's design is. Mm -hmm. um, and we know how, how uh, and when I say we, I mean the church, people who've been in the church, we, uh, we know what that design is and and many who aren't outside who who aren't in the church and are outside the church um probably feel uh either appropriately or maybe uh maybe just through um hearing conversations here and there they feel that we don't approve of their lifestyles and so forth but mm -hmm. bottom line is when we talk about his design for sexuality uh, there is a lot of hurt associated with it and there's a lot of pain with people even in the church. I just know for here, um, there are a lot of families who are walking through it. So here's what I, here's my first question to you. Mm -hmm. um, as a pastor, and as you pastor there in Nashville, what are some of the conversations you're having around it? What are some of the things that you're seeing? Um, how are you counseling people in the church through these difficult mm -hmm. conversations and, and uh, with parents, with teenagers, all, you know, Take it wherever you want to, but just I'll try to keep it pretty broad to open us up of what are some of the things you're seeing and how are you approaching it? Well, I, I think um, now, you know, the time that we're living in is, is, you know, these 
these questions and concerns have become more amplified mm -hmm. uh, and more ubiquitous than they have in my lifetime. And uh, there's a trickiness to it as well, because you've also got this new, uh, what some call deconstructionist movement, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and or so-called progressive Christianity that seeks to blend uh, together, merge together, syncretize together, um, Christian, certain, certain Christian, uh, commitments like a commitment to grace, uh, a, an appreciation for the love of Jesus and how Jesus shows up for every kind of sinner and makes himself accessible to every kind of sinner. Um, but, but with a devaluation of, mm -hmm of repentance and mm. denying yourself as opposed to expressing yourself, um, um, you know, seeking, seeking counsel and correction as opposed to seeking affirmation mm. uh, for those parts of our lives where we are out of line mm. with the gospel and with the clear um, presentation of biblical ethics that, that, that the scriptures give us. And um, I, I think personally you have to do a lot of, very creative interpretation in order to arrive at anything other than uh, sex is reserved for marriage only right. and marriage is reserved for one man and one woman only. I, I think that with the scripture as your resource, I, I think you've just got to do a whole lot of dancing yeah. um, with blindfolds on in order to arrive at any conclusion about sex and marriage that that either adds to or subtracts from mm. that, um, from that vision. Uh, it's, it's quite clear. And, and, and yet we're in a time where, uh, expressive individualism is, is the, um, the primary and preferred strategy for determining what is true, mm. right? Uh, expressive ind individualism, meaning I determine what my truth is yep. and you determine what your truth is. And even if your truth and my truth are in complete contradiction to one another, uh, they don't rule one another out somehow. They're both true at the same time because it's your right to be you and it's my right to be me. Mm -hmm. And um, the unpardonable sin is to, um, to suggest that somebody might be on uh, a path that is not healthy or life-giving or morally virtuous and right. and and so um it's tricky because you know back in the 50s and way back in the days of jesus the assumption was we we find out what the truth is by looking outside of ourselves not looking inside of ourselves mm -hmm. to ultimately uh our ultimate source the one who created us the one who designed us who fashioned us and who also defines what it means to flourish as a human being uh, as a fish can only flourish inside the water, a human being can only flourish to the degree that he or she is surrendered to the design that God's given us in Scripture. And so um, we live in a weird, challenging time because we have, for instance, parent generations that um, that that think in terms of the scriptures coming in and editing and revising us, mm. um, you know, that the truth is, truth comes from outside of us, from God. Uh, in conversation with other generations or mindsets that say, well, no, the truth comes within and nothing outside, uh, you know, can, you know, the truth from within me gets to revise anything that comes at me from right. the outside and edit that. And, and so, so it's even hard to have the conversation if you're not starting from the same assumptions. Mm. Um, and so it's, it's been very tricky, uh, especially in families and in friendships and places of work and, mm. um, you know, even within, the evangelical landscape, the yeah, evangelical sure. Christian landscape, it's become a challenge. Uh, so. Let me ask you this on that front. How have you personally seen or, or some of the, maybe things you've observed um, in the way of how, how have Christians in, sought to engage in the conversation around sexuality in helpful ways? How have they... How have we, not they, have we engaged in unhelpful ways? And yeah. any thoughts you have around that? Um, 
uh, I think, you know, there, there, there's polar extreme, there's a continuum, right? Mm-hmm. Somewhere in the middle of that continuum is, is health and something that Christ would yeah. uh, be pleased with. Right. But on the far end of the continuum on, on one side is, um, you know, maybe what you could call a truth without grace mm. uh, model uh, where, uh, where Christians are experienced as being corrective, but not kind or compassionate. Mm. Uh, and then on the other side of the continuum, Christians are experienced as being kind and compassionate, but but never corrective. And mm-hmm. so you might call that the grace without truth the, uh, approach. But the problem is truth that is absent of grace isn't really true. And grace mm-hmm. that is absent of truth isn't really gracious. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, there have to be times where um, direct words are spoken, right? And And, you know, for anybody who might resist that, let me appeal to you on this basis. Let's just say... Um, you are um, a spouse or you're a parent and your spouse or your child uh, gets involved with uh, crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. And um, and every day you and the rest of the family are having to contend with that. Um, The idea that everybody gets to determine what their own truth is and what their own pathway to health is rules out the possibility of you having any right to get angry, upset, Mm. grieved uh, at that person who's destroying both themselves and the environment of your family. You have no right. uh, If you, if you believe that everybody has to, has a right to determine their own path. Right. Uh, And so um, I know that's an extreme example. um, uh, But, you know, let, let's let's bring it into a more realistic example. Let's say you've got two spouses and one spouse finds a, a cancerous lump under their armpit. And the spouse who loves them says, look, I want I want three more decades with you. Uh, so let's fight this. And then the one with the lump says, nope, uh, I, I don't want to deal with the discomfort. I don't want surgery. I don't want chemo. I don't want to waste time and money going to doctors. Um, you know, uh, that, that in some cases is a real life situation where, where a sick person yeah. won't get treatment and, and it affects the loved ones. Um, and so let's just take that into the, the biblical ethics conversation. Um, you know, whether, whether you feel that your expression of sexuality, whether it's, you know, through, the biblical model and and vision for sexuality and marriage, or whether it's, you know, pornography use, which is very popular and celebrated these days. Mm. Um, uh, it, you know, it's, it's ironic to me that, you know, by the same group of people with the same mindset, uh, Hugh Hefner, uh, a, you know, a, an icon in, in the porn, the world of pornography, um, who had, you know, serial relationships with, with younger women, uh, whose, whose industry is widely known for trafficking young girls and women into pornography and, and into enslavement is widely celebrated, uh, as a civil rights activist, Mm -hmm. um, 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 you know, advancing freedom, uh, while at the same time, the same group of people are, um, you know, very rightly, you know, trying to confront things like racism or, mm. um, you know, abuse in the workplace. And, and so this is this double standard. Yeah. Um, and I, I know that's a little bit of a, a rabbit trail, but the bottom line is we don't get to just decide on our own. We are, we are not our own authority mm. to decide what's healthy and good and right and true. We need outside voices, whether it's doctors, whether it's educators, uh, and especially on the grand scheme of things, God Himself, uh, we we need out we need input from the outside and leadership and even lordship from the outside in order to have a fighting chance at health. Mm. And um, you know that's true physically, that's true relationally. It has to be true spiritually and morally and ethically as well. Mm. And as I see it, the sexuality and marriage conversation is is very explicit. <laughs> you know, yeah. the guardrails are there and they're very, very tight, but within those guardrails, there's abundant freedom. Um, so yeah, you know, both for married and, and unmarried people, abundant freedom 
sexually inside marriage, abundant freedom outside of marriage to, you know, as Paul says, devote your life wholeheartedly to the Lord's concerns or, you know, pour into people in, in ways that maybe a married couple can't pour into due to lack of time and, and you know, kids at home and, and things like that. Mm. So anyway, yeah, there's a lot and, more to be said on that. Yeah. And a lot of what you're saying is, is so good because in, in, in a lot of ways, what we're saying about the conversation from a Christian ethic and biblical worldview uh, of sexuality is getting, really getting to the core questions that are always at play in any in any conversation that's that's around kind of worldview and ethics and in the sense of what is truth how do we determine truth what is what is true freedom um and who decides it where do we establish worth where do we de- where, where what is where where are the lines of morality if there are any and if if there are some then what are they based on you know all that's at play in this conversation like it is in in many others um when we when we think about, I mean, I'll just make a comment here and then and then ask you another question. But when we think about the culture that we're the waters that we're swimming in right now, um, it absolutely is um, a a a norm right now that the that affirmation equals love. Mm-hmm. You know, to love someone is to affirm all of their choices and all of their um, ways of defining life and expression and so forth. Um, we are to be a people if, if we're in fact following Christ and allowing him to do what he does in us and fill us with his spirit. We're to be a people who love well. It's, it's the greatest ethic of the church is to love and uh, to love like Christ. So Scott, any, qu- any, any, um, any comments or thoughts you have on what, what does it look like tangibly any any things you can offer ideas thoughts things you've seen things you've done in your own life to love those who are outside of god's design without affirming uh, so yeah yeah if i could answer that in two ways yeah uh you know I, I i'll maybe put an exclamation point on the things i just shared with a quote from becky pippert okay. uh, she's a very thoughtful christian woman She says, uh, we tend to be taken aback by the thought that God could be angry. How can a deity who is perfect and loving ever be angry? We take pride in our tolerance of the excesses of others. So what is God's problem? But love, real love, detests what destroys the beloved. Mm. Real love stands against the deception, the lie, the sin that destroys um, That's good. let's see here. Uh, and then she quotes somebody who said, human love offers a true analogy. The more a father loves his son, the more he hates in his son, the drunkard, the liar, and the traitor. Anger is not the opposite of love. Hate is the opposite of love. And the final form of hate is indifference. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that, that's a shout out mm-hmm. for redemptive truth telling. Um, you know, because we love people, we want to, um, steer them. We want to steer each other and we want other people to steer us away from the path of unhealth and potential destruction. At the same time, you know, Jesus, the scriptures talk a lot about speaking the truth in love. Um, you know, love is patient, love is kind. We, we've got the full definition of, of what love is, what it looks like, what it feels like in first Corinthians 13, it rejoices with the truth. So it's truth telling. Um, but it also bears all things, hopes all things, believes all things, endures all things. You know, love is patient. That's the that's the number. That's the first definition of love. And, right. and um, you know, I, I, I think the challenge for Christians, uh, as well as the call, the moral imperative for Christians, uh, is to simultaneously be flexing the muscles of compassion and conviction all at the same time. Mm. Uh, and because if you lose one, you lose both. And um, you know, Jesus's life is filled with this, right? So this Sunday, I'm, I'm preaching a sermon. And in that sermon, I'm going to reference Matthew 23, where Jesus excoriates the scribes and the Pharisees <laughs> for their smugness and their self-righteousness. What a great just word. Excoriate. Dresses them down. Yeah, yeah. He just dresses them down with, 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 with confrontation, with conviction. And then that chapter ends with him looking over Jerusalem. 
mm. uh, which is being run by the scribes and Pharisees. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, mm. how I have longed to gather you under my wings like a, like a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. There's this grief, there's this lament, this compassion, you know, and we get the, the parable of the two lost sons uh, in uh, Luke 15. You know, one shows his lostness by, by you know, squandering his inheritance and leaving home and squandering it on prostitutes and wild living. The other one demonstrates his lostness through a smug self-righteousness. Um, and, you know, the one who leaves home is all about expressive individualism, right? Um, you know, I'm going to go live my truth. Uh, and it doesn't work out well for him in the end. He has a lot of fun uh, <laughs> and what feels like a lot of freedom. That's right. A whole time. But in the end of that season of freedom, he's referring to himself as a slave. Mm. Uh, and then the other son, uh, just he has no joy because he wants the same thing that the other son wants. Uh, you know, he just wants the father's stuff. He doesn't want the father's heart or the father's mm. face or the father's rules or the father's guidelines, right? He wants to run the show. And when the father gestures, you know, after he receives the prodigal, he also gestures to the smug, self-righteous, grumpy one. Mm. Um, all I have is also yours. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's like he's saying, you know, you're a jerk for Jesus right now, but, but come yeah. on in, you yeah. know, this, my home belongs to you. My heart belongs to you just as it does your brother. And, and, you know, the love of Christ is scandalous. And, you know, with respect to like, for instance, we've had, a, we've had a, you know, our fair share of, of, um, of same sex couples mm. um, come into our church because for whatever reason, there's some things about our church that they, they feel is different mm. uh, than the standard kind of evangelical posture. Um, in that they feel welcomed, they feel loved, they feel invited into friendship, um, they feel um, uh, as if they uh, can, um, you know, be meaningfully present for the preaching of the gospel, etc., uh, while also knowing that um, in the end, uh, <laughs> they're going to need to make a decision about whether or not our church is going to be the church for them, because um, there is no pathway uh, to merging uh, Christian faith with um, uh, with with you know their particular um, um, you know choices in, in 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 that regard. And so so we've we've been that kind of church where, for instance, a a, a gay couple or co or a cohabiting couple um, can come in and be really drawn in mm -hmm. for a time. But eventually, they, they they either change their minds about yeah. their lives and how they're living them, or they'll leave. Yeah. Uh, and if if there never comes a point where, uh, you know, folks don't either change their minds and 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 put themselves under the lordship of of Scripture and of Christ, or leave, um, it might be that we're being a bit too accommodating and and mm -hmm. and shying away a bit too much from. The truth of the gospel mm. Mm. um but if they never show up and never want to have anything to do with us and mm. don't perceive that that there is care uh for anyone mm. uh in That's our good. within our walls whether they believe as we do or whether we whether they don't um you know then there there might be an absence of of truth telling and 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 so you know there's this balance right where jesus is always welcoming sinners and he's eating with them uh, and he's always calling them to repentance over a meal. You know, it's it's uh, the woman caught in the act of adultery. The very first thing he says mm. to her is, I, "I don't condemn you." In other words, welcome. Uh, yeah. Let's let's be friends. Um, mm. Now that we've established that that my posture toward you is love and compassion and care, mm -hmm. when these other men just wanted to stone you to death, uh, while also apparently covering over the sin of the man who was caught in the act of adultery by not dragging him <laughs> right. into, the, into the square. <laughs> right. Um, we, we often miss you that know, part They're the all gone. You know, I did the whole gotcha question on them and I, I'm, I'm here to protect you. Um, I'm here to protect, mm. you know, guilt and shame ridden people from religious bullies. That's part of what Jesus does. It's part of his vocation. Mm. It's part of the church's vocation as well. Um, but now we've got to talk about mm. your ethics because yeah. your ethics are going to destroy you. Right. Uh, They're if, still if, repentance. If they don't change. Right. Yeah. That's right. And, and so it's got to be both ends. Yeah. I love how you just frame that, uh, even in just what we see in Jesus and, um, 
you know, the, his ability and what he demonstrated that we see on the pages of Scripture. Um, yeah, I, I think about I think about the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and how clearly in the way that he approached her, there was such care, there was such compassion uh, that she was so drawn to him. Uh, but yet at the same time, he um, he didn't shy away from very much exposing. You know, you know, it's not just one husband. You've been with five men. You know, there's there was conviction and truth, and uh, but in a way that um, that was so inviting. And um, I love how you just said that too about how part of what Jesus does for sure uh, is protect us and and rescue us even from the religious bullies. But that doesn't mean that he still doesn't. You know, that he he re, he refrains from calling us into his design and purpose Mm -hmm. and into the transforming work of the gospel in our lives. And so, um, so Scott, you, um, as a pastor, I would imagine you get asked a question that I get asked often. I'm getting, I'm getting it asked a lot right now because of the sermon series that we're in. But, um, but it was a, it was a common question even before we began teaching on these topics. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's simply the the heart wrenching question of a parent who loves the Lord, who's walking with the Lord, and desperately wants their children to as well. Mm-hmm. And their ch- their child has either rejected the faith and embraced a um, alter- alternative sexual lifestyle or identity, mm-hmm. or is embracing the faith, but one that would be um, giving permission to still continue a sexually permissive lifestyle or identity outside of what we would say is God's design. What do you say to those parents who come and say, what do I do? What do I, how do I engage my child? What do I, mm-hmm. how do I, <laughs> you know, sometimes the heart cry seems is though, and sometimes it is blatantly this, and then sometimes it's, it's veiled, but is help me change my child. How do I do it? You know, that's what they're really longing for. But what, yeah. what do you, what do you say? I would say read everything that Preston Sprinkle has written on the subject. Mm. Um, uh, read everything that Sam Alberry has written on the subject. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to go back, you know, read read everything that Francis Schaeffer has written. Mm. Um, yeah, because these are people who live in that world and have these conversations over and over and over again. Yeah, um, and they've just got a, a cumulative accrued wisdom from, from experience. Um, and I would say, you know, immerse yourself in, you know, the thought uh, and perspective and pastoral instincts of people who've been there um, and who are Orthodox mm. um, before uh, you uh, over engage the mm. conversation, um, you know, equip yourself for that, um, you don't want to, uh, a lot of times, you know, the, the conversation will get sabotaged by fear, right? A, a parent will just be afraid and, mm. and, and kind of either go on the attack, uh, or mm-hmm. go on the retreat out of fear. Um, but I would say this number one, uh, they're your kid mm-hmm. and they're always going to be your kid and you don't want to lose the relationship. Uh, as far as it depends on you. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean that, that if, if you're faithful, you won't, you absolutely most certainly won't lose ground or lose the relationship because sometimes anything short of complete, not just acceptance, but affirmation and celebration is just not enough, not sufficient. It's interpreted as you don't love me, mm-hmm. uh, et cetera. Um, and Jesus said, one of the things I came to do is divide households, mm. you know, divide, divide parents from their children, uh, even. Yeah, that's not one that we keep me. on our fridge, is it? It's <laughs> not. And it's not one that we, you know, put in the children's Bibles that we read to our little children, <laughs> right? right? But, right. but yeah. um, but it's there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Christ demands our first and highest mm. loyalty, yeah. period. If we don't hate our own spouse in mm. comparison to our love for Christ, <laughs> then then we've got our loves disordered and backwards. Now, hate is not hate. Uh, right. It's a 
you know, your your love and loyalty to Christ should be so thorough uh, and 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 first level uh, that that your love for anything or anything else should seem like hate in comparison. But but the but the but the gift on the back end is. As C.S. Lewis said, if you aim at heaven, you get earth thrown in. Mm. Uh, in other words, if you love Christ more than you love your kids, you're going to end up loving your kids better mm-hmm. than you would if you loved your kids more than you love Christ. Mm. Um, and so you get everything. Uh, if, if you put Christ first, you get everything. If you put Christ second or third, you get nothing mm. uh, in the end. Um, but in terms of parents, you know, based on my own um, you know, pastoral experience and, and walking this road, both, you know, in my own family, uh, extended family situation, and, um, and also, you know, within the church, out in the community, etc. cetera. Um, do not underestimate the power of loving your kid unconditionally. Mm. Just, and, and just starting the conversation with, look, no matter what direction you choose with your life, I am never going to stop loving you. Mm. Uh, I am never going to stop uh, welcoming you and and uh, wanting the best for you. Um, and so that's the baseline. Uh, one thing that I will guarantee to you is I will always love you and I am always going to be here for you, mm. period, no matter what you choose to do with your life. Um, and you know, it's kind of in the pattern of what Jesus did with the woman caught in the act of adultery. Hey, you know, you're in this whole swirl of condemnation. I don't condemn you. Mm. Your maker does not condemn you. The one who made the stars does not condemn you. Um, and so I think we've got to really consider what that means with our kids. And, and then, you know, a lot of it really depends on the depth of relationship that you've built over the course mm. of your child's life and the, 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 the depth and degree of trust that is or is not there right? based on the life you've had together up to this point. Uh, I would say if, if, if you haven't had a great, you know, trust building pathway from childhood all the way up to the present, then tread a lot more gently and a lot more lightly and a lot more carefully and be quick to listen and slow to speak. Yeah. Um, but to the degree that there's a, a rich, solid foundation of relationship and trust formed there, um, which can be built, you know, you can start now. If you never started before, you can start now. Yeah, it's never too um, late. Yep. When the trust is there, uh, or at least when some trust is there, you can say, look, um, you know, I'm, I'm in a bit of a bind here because um, you know that, you know, Christianity as we as we see it, as we understand it, as we read it in the scripture, um, you know, one of the primary tenets is that, that my first loyalty has to be to Jesus Christ, which means I cannot be loyal uh, to a way of life that Christ um, uh, speaks against. Mm. And, and, um, and then I would surround that, you know, every time with don't forget, no matter what you choose, mm. I will always be your mom or your dad, and I will always love you, and yeah. I will never turn my back on you. Mm. Um, but but you've got to say it. You know, mm. I, I had this conversation with a friend of mine who came out as as gay. This was years ago when we were in New York City, and um, and he said, you know, I, I just you know, and we've had these conversations. We had a history together mm. of friendship and trust and you know he'd gotten a partner and everything and he's like well what do you think you know and i I said well actually you know your partner seems like a really great guy very kind nice guy um he's like no but what do you think about us not what do you think about him what do you think about us and i said surely you know what i think (laughs) um yeah and he says well well, wait a minute i mean you you got dinner with us and like like experiencing our love doesn't doesn't in any way, you know, cause you to want to maybe change your mind. And, uh, you know, how, how could you, Scott, ask me to, um, deny the love of my life? Mm. And, and I said, you know, that's a, ah, boy, what a weighty question. But, Mm. but the only response I could think of is candidly, and, and you know, this is somebody who knows the scriptures, um, 
you know, to, to affirm the love of your life would be to deny the love of my life. Mm. How can, how can you ask me to deny Jesus mm-hmm. um, yeah. in order to affirm, you know, right. what you're, what you're asking me or maybe even demanding that I, that I affirm. Um, and that was a hard conversation, but I'll tell you what, he, he left that conversation, I think, respecting, mm. uh our friendship and appreciating our friendship a lot more uh, than he would have if I had come down really hard on him. Yeah. Or if I had just been willy nilly and, and said, Oh, you know, you be you. Yeah. I'll be me. Yeah. We'll just agree to disagree agreeably. Sure. Um, if I soften it, actually that, that, that leads to, you know, ironically a, a greater level of disrespect um, mm. than just, telling people what you think, but doing it in a way that they, they know and they feel that you're loving them while you do it. Like when the rich ruler and, and Jesus encounter happened, um, you know, it says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. Mm. Uh, and it also said that when he walked away, um, choosing his wealth over Christ, it says that he walked away sad, Yeah, yeah. not, not feeling beaten up or condemned. And, and, you know, when he's walking away sad, you know, that's an indication that he feels like he's giving something up, yeah. um, you know, in, in order to chase after something else. Yeah, he's losing something of great value yes. or something of Jesus lesser. gave him pause. Yeah. Uh, you know, the way that Jesus treated him yeah. gave him pause mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. his ethical choices. You know, one of the things that um, you mentioned Sam Alberry and, and, uh, and sprinkle and you know, I think of Rebecca McLaughlin. McLaughlin. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, she's another one I'd uh, say. Home run. Home yeah, run for her. Yeah. And and she she has lived with same sex attraction like like Sam has. Sure. Yeah. Um and, and she's married. Like Sam has chosen the path of singleness. Right. Rebecca as a same sex attracted Christian woman chose the path of marriage to to a man. Sure. Um and they're both flourishing. Uh totally. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I hear a lot from them is I've listened to them and read them is something that you touched on there. And uh, I'll just maybe wrap up with this and honor your time and our listeners' time. But um, there seems to be a, a bit of a misunderstanding at play a lot of times in the conversation around sexuality, which is um, for someone who experiences same-sex attraction, the call to follow Jesus is a call to greater self-denial than the call for the heterosexual to, to follow Jesus. And, and one of the things that I've heard them try to position is to say, well, in some ways, maybe that's true in the sense of there's going to be some things that, uh, you know, like the rich young ruler, I'm, I'm giving up, but what I'm gaining is so much more, but the call for all believers, for anyone to follow Jesus is always a call of self-denial to give up what we most value uh, for the sake of finding our greater, greater worth and value in Jesus, um, and I, and I, you know, I realize that's that's easy for me to say as a as a as a heterosexual, and you know, I've had conversations with uh, with friends who are saying, "Man, well, you know, you you haven't experienced what I've experienced." I I, I get all that, but I think the only point I'm trying to make is that there is a self denial component that Jesus was very upfront about. If you want to follow me, you must take up your cross daily mm-hmm. deny yourself and follow me. Yeah. And um and in yeah. so doing and I think you know if we don't include this last part where it's just it just becomes some form of some spiritualized form of asceticism, you know, it's like hey just beat yourself mm-hmm. up and feel better because you feel more religious. Um yeah. but it's in so doing you find life. Mm-hmm. You, you flourish in Christ and mm-hmm. he's the maker of life. So he's the one in whom we find the life that is that that we most long for, right? Even when it requires us to deny what we most deeply feel, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's hard. I mean, I don't think anyone would say, "Oh, yeah, that's an easy <laughs> an easy thing to do," but it's yeah. incredibly yeah. incredibly difficult. Any thoughts around that uh, as we wrap yeah. up here, Scott? So, um, what a lot of American Christians don't realize is that when when Paul says in Romans. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved, it was a fiercely uh, subversive political statement because the mantra in Rome was Caesar is Lord. 
Mm. And um, I think our modern day Caesar is feelings. Um, yeah. yeah. To, to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord is, is also to confess that feelings are not Lord. Mm. Uh, that's good. And, um, and that's going to, that's going to get some backlash. It might not get you killed uh, like it got Christians killed in Rome, but it will, it will get you some backlash. Um, but what, I think probably the parting thought I would want to share Jeff um, is, you know, if, if, if you're a Christian and you know, you're, you're distressed, let's say about the, the acceleration of, um, you know, LGBTQ uh, into the mainstream um, and how it affects society, how it affects your kids, et cetera. And, you know, maybe you consider yourself, kind of a, a culture warrior for biblical marriage, please realize that the very first um, responsibility that you have to have any right to speak into these things is to have a biblical marriage, mm. which means you're not looking at porn, mm. uh, which means that you are not only not committing uh, infidelity against your spouse, but, but you are actively pursuing your spouse and, and leaning in to, um, you know, a, a dynamic in your relationship with your spouse that, 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 that pictures Christ in the church as, mm. as it's portrayed to us in Ephesians five. If you're, if you're not, if you don't have your own marriage, uh, and, and sexuality within your marriage in order, mm. then you've got no business, uh, being a more moral, um, uh, you know, bullhorn mm -hmm. for culture or for anyone else. Mm. Uh, so let's just make sure that we have um, we have the moral authority mm. to be able to even talk about these things with any level of concern. Mm. And I, I don't mean that to come across as a scold or a reprimand, but uh, I mean, so many of these conversations that, that actually could have gone really well were sabotaged because of a, of a tone of, not a tone, but a, but a reality of, of, of moral inconsistency. Yeah. Um, on the part of the one who's doing the preaching about how other people, mm. uh, you know, need to look at their lives in this regard. Mm. Um, you know, ask yourself, is your, is your marriage, is your heterosexual marriage as committed mm. <laughs> as, as some, some gay marriages, you know, some gay marriages are deeply committed, mm. uh, as, as out of step with scripture as they are, your, your marriage commitment needs to be be at least, you know, on the same level of commitment yeah. in your biblical marriage, um, you know, so that you have a, at least you have grounds from which to, you know, have some sort of credibility. And yeah. so, you know, Jeff, you can choose to keep that or strike that from, <laughs> from, from the edits, but, um, you know, hypocrisy is a, is a, is a killer. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, you know, what Tim Keller calls a defeater belief. Like, yeah. like if you're not, if you're, if you're doing the do as I say, but not as I do thing, um, you know, if, if, if in the name of confronting sin in culture or sin in somebody else, uh, we are not presenting to them a beautiful alternative mm. that <laughs> is desirable in the, in the way that Jesus presented a beautiful, desirable alternative to the rich ruler that led the rich ruler to walk off feeling sad instead of judged. Mm. Um, we just need to do our own work. Yeah. Um, as part of that picture. Yeah. And, and maybe one way to sum that up is let's be a people of repentance ourselves. Yes. If we're going to call people out there to repent, may it be also because we are a people of repentance and, and grieving over our own sin uh, as deeply and even more passionately as we do the, the sins of others. Mm -hmm. So Scott, I'm grateful for you, brother. Thank you for spending time with us. Um, I've loved this entire time. I've loved that quote over your your left shoulder there. All all sad <laughs> things become untrue. Uh, from... There's a great story about that sign in the book, by the way. Oh, awesome. Um, it's, great. It's just one of the most moving stories I've ever gotten to be part of. Wow. So, well, there's a great teaser. A little, to, little teaser there. There you go to remind everyone to read. Go read Beautiful People Don't <laughs> Just Happen. Um, but Scott, thanks again for taking time. Thanks for all you who have joined us either uh, uh, here with uh, YouTube or, or uh, listening in whatever capacity that you are. I uh, hope this has been a blessing to you. Uh, we, we hope that this has been something that as we have dug deeper into these 
uh, these issues and topics that uh, they've helped you process, they've helped you uh, even think through and, Lord willing, pray through uh, these issues. And ultimately, that's where I would encourage you to go. I mean, of course, you have pastors like Scott, myself, and others. You have people and friends. But ultimately, uh, maybe we'd be going to the Lord with these issues, seeking His heart, seeking His word, letting Him speak to us in ways that shape us into His image. So thanks for joining us. We'll look forward to having you again uh, with our next episode.